Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the March meeting of the New York chapter of the Association for Recorded Sound Collections. And tonight we're going to have a very special guest who essentially is on, would wear how many hats? Composer, record distributor. Uh, public speaker. Public speaker too, Sean Hickey. And his topic is gonna to be on the classical music recording industry. It's present and future landscape. Are there a lot of weeds in it? There is, okay. A whole lot of weeds, yeah, okay. The role of new media and the pitfalls and opportunities for the artists and, and the supplier community. What I'd like to do is, Sean Hickey, of course, will talk about the subject, but let me give you a little introduction on who he is. Mr. Hickey was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1970. His earliest musical education began at the age of 12 with an electric guitar, a PV amp, and a stack of Van Halen records, the early ones, of course. He studied jazz guitar at Oakland University, later graduating with a degree in composition and theory from Wayne State University. His primary instructors were James Hartway, James Lentini, and Leslie Bassett. Performances of his orchestral, choral, chamber, and solo works have, been taken, have taken place in five continents, and his numerous recordings have been critically acclaimed, the most recent of which, A Pacifying Weapon, received the gold medal in the Global Music Awards. He also lectures regularly at conferences, colleges, and conservatories on the subjects of music entrepreneurship, skills for composers, and opportunities in the new media. May I introduce Sean Hickey? Sean, it is all yours for the evening. Thank you, good evening. Good to see everybody here. Um, thanks for having me. Um, as Seth mentioned, I do some of these talks at schools, colleges, um, universities, other places, but never, I think, before uh, such an audience of true record collectors. So first, I want to thank you all for that. There aren't many of you, and we're very grateful for you. So I um, want to talk a little bit about me and my work and the business that, uh, that I do and the work that I do at Noxos and um, give you a little background on me. So uh, Seth gave you the, the, the short bio there. Uh, you'll see behind me a couple of recordings that I've uh, done over the years. Uh, I am a composer. As you can see, there's uh, the first two there. Uh, um, a couple of years ago, a disc uh, recording of my uh, chamber and piano works, Cursive, uh, was released on the Delos label. And then most recently, a pacifying weapon, uh, which came out in Our Recordings. Our Recordings is the uh, record label of the recorder virtuoso, Michela Petri, who commissioned the work, uh, which is a, a, a a concerto for recorder and a very specific orchestra that I recorded in Copenhagen. Um, but I thought we just, since we're talking about music and we want to take a couple minutes to maybe listen to some, if that's all right with everyone, uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of my work, uh, I thought we would uh, just play a bit, or at least the last movement of my clarinet concerto. Uh, this is a concerto for clarinet and string orchestra uh, that I recorded in St. Petersburg four years ago now. And um, if we can, let's maybe just hear a little bit. Thank you. 
my music. That was the, uh, thank you. That was the, th yeah. Why Russia? Uh, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I recorded two works there on two different trips. Uh, the cello concerto, which is on the same recording I recorded there. Uh, why Russia? Um, first of all, it's quite inexpensive to make an orchestral record there. At least it was when I did it, and it still is. Um, on the whole, it's roughly 20% uh, of what it would cost you here, and about 30% less than you would in Western Europe. Um, so, and I have a friend here, Vladimir Landa, who's the conductor of that recording in St. Petersburg uh, State Symphony, also called the Academic Symphony, also called the Philharmonic. Um, and uh, he's a conductor of Baltimore Opera and a couple of other orchestras here and has dual citizenship, makes a lot of recordings there for Noxos and Shandos and other labels. So um, he connected me. Uh, Dmitry Kozov, who commissioned the cello concerto, is also from Petersburg. Um, and then Alex Fitterstein, who you heard playing clarinet there, um, is not from there, but uh, was really eager to go, to go to Russia. He was born in the former Soviet Union and, uh, and, and record there. So that's, that's why we did it. It was a great experience. So, um, Anyway, so you heard a little bit of a, a flavor of my music. I passed around a couple of recordings, including my most recent, which is called A Pacifying Weapon, uh, which is an LP only release as well as digital, of course. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about formats because I think that might be of interest uh, to some people here. Uh, a bit of background, when I graduated from school, I studied music in Detroit, and when I got out, like many people, we thought, what the hell comes next? And uh, I was certainly nervous as to uh, what that meant for me as a uh, composer and a student of music. And what did I do? I went to work at a record store. <laughs> If you remember those, uh, and even if you don't remember those, once upon a time there were even classical music only record stores, and I was a uh, assistant manager of one of those in Detroit, um, where I met some people who were in the distribution community. This was in the early 90s at the real ascendance of the compact disc, uh, when everyone was buying CD players and replacing their vinyl collections with CDs, um, and the industry was uh, never as big uh, in physical sales as it was. Uh, during those my first 10 years of my career. Um, and I got a job with a distribution company, Allegro, that had me handle sales for um, a variety of states and the province of Ontario in the Midwest. They later took me to New York in 1998, uh, where I stayed with them for a bit and then moved on to the RCA Victor Group, BMG. Uh, there I was the uh, field sales manager for classics and jazz uh, at the time for a couple of years. 9-11 happened. Uh, I got the job where I met you, John, uh, literally on that day, and um, stayed there for a year before going to Noxos, uh, where I've been ever since. That was uh, 16 years ago now. So um, bringing up to the present a little bit, at Noxos, um, just to make a real distinction, because I think everybody here probably knows Noxos, the label from the seas of white covers, uh, and Tower Records, and HMV, and Virgin, and all of that. Um, we're both a record label, and a distribution company. I work for the distribution company and the American one, Noxus of America. Uh, I'm the senior vice president in charge of sales and business, business development for the company. I also handle some retail operations. Uh, as we've grown, have a lot of responsibilities, uh, but I oversee our physical sales revenue for this continent and our digital sales revenue for the world. Um, so there's that. Um, the Noxus of America Label Group, we handle the distribution uh, of over 650 record labels, uh, physical format throughout uh, the, this hemisphere, uh, and over 850 labels in digital. Uh, and by digital, I mean download, streaming, apps, however you may access music, and all of those agreements are worldwide agreements. Um, as you can imagine, digital music recognizes no political borders. It observes no sovereignty. Uh, it is a great equalizer of the genre of classical music, and we'll talk a little bit about access uh, as we get into uh, our discussion a little bit. Um, stat that I have there of the uh, nearly 4,800 commercially released recordings of classical music last year, uh, about 4,000 of them are released by uh, ours and our distributed labels. Uh, it basically means that if you've listened to, engaged with classical music in any way, uh, shape, or form over the last several years, chances are it would have touched 
uh, our distribution network, uh, whether you heard it in a film, uh, television commercial, YouTube video, uh, you bought a CD, you streamed it, you downloaded it from someplace, chances are it would have come through, through us, and there are, of course, exceptions to that. Um, one may not know this because uh, you know, a lot of people feel that the physical format has died altogether, all and we'll talk a bit about that, but 2017 was the most bountiful year for classical uh, music recordings, and there's certainly more consumption options for the consumer uh, than ever before, and more revenue opportunities for the content holder, for the labels, for the artists, for the composers, uh, for anyone in the distribution chain. Um, I have here just a couple of resources that I use to uh, refer to uh, in a couple of elements in my life. I have obviously an artistic hat uh, that I wear in my role as a composer. I'm constantly promoting my work, fulfilling commissions, seeking performances, uh, opportunities for recording and things like that. And I wear an administrative hat in my role at Noxos. Um, and one of my models uh, is the great American composer and administrator, uh, William Schumann. Uh, you'll see here a couple of books that Joe Polisi, uh, Dean of the Juilliard School, wrote about him and also the artist as citizen, another uh, concept I believe uh, very strongly. And I speak with uh, the roughly 9,000 artists that we deal with uh, all the time on, on artist citizenry uh, in 2018 and how uh, that really helps improve the sort of classical music ecosystem. I believe it's very much uh, an ecosystem that uh, needs a lot of uh, life force in order for it to, um, you know, to be, you know, thriving. Um, just a couple other, uh, you know, stats and things here that I can uh, share. Um, so, of the 37 Grammy-nominated recordings under our label uh, family, 29 are as a direct result result of artist ensemble or composer uh, network building, recruitment, and mobilizing base. This is the biggest change probably to the industry that we've seen in the last several years. It's not, the, uh, it's not about format necessarily, though that's obviously a very, very, very big change, uh, but the fact that the sort of gatekeepers in the world of classical music, the labels in the ivory towers uh, that used to exist on Broadway, Fifth Avenue, uh, the Unter den Linden and all the great streets of the world, cultural capitals, uh, don't necessarily exist anymore. Uh, the onus on the success of a recording often really comes down to the artist, uh, him or herself. And the engagement of those artists with many of the services is the difference between a successful recording and one that's not. Stop me if I'm talking too fast, too much. Please ask any question that you can. Uh, we'll dig into some of these things uh, a little more. So. Um, May I ask, who in the last year has bought a compact disc? Great. How about uh, an LP, a record? Okay, good. Uh, new, anyone? Yeah, new or used? Okay, yeah. Uh, how about a download? Okay. How about streamed music of any kind? You have to have all your hands up. There's no way in hell that you haven't streamed music. Absolutely. Yep. No, streamed. How many of you have purchased? Oh, sorry. Having stream. Yes, having stream. Anyone to stream, right? So, including YouTube, everyone has, everyone does, and you probably do it daily. And uh, and that's obviously probably the biggest change uh, in our business in the last several years. For many people. Uh, for so many people, and especially younger people who might come through uh, college and university system or from any walk of life, really, most people have accessed music um, through one of the streaming services, including YouTube. YouTube is far and away the biggest industry killer of anything, bar none. Um, why is it that uh, it is that way? Since so many people utilize it and so many people take it for granted. It's more of an industry changer than Spotify, Apple Music, or any of the other services. I always tell a story about a uh, somewhat notable uh, pianist who I had coffee with maybe four or five years ago, uh, and we, um, she wanted some advice on her career or whatever, and we sat down, had coffee, it's a typical situation, coffee, coffee, phone, phone, sitting there on the table, and uh, so I asked her exactly what I asked you, you know, how do you, how do you listen to music? Do you buy CDs? Do you, you know, do you, where do you buy them? 
Uh, she said, no. I'm like, do you download music? She said, no. I'm like, well, what about Spotify? You have Spotify on your phone? Do you utilize Spotify? No. I said, well, how do, you, how do you listen to music? She said, well, YouTube, of course. And, um, you know, it really hit me, the, that fact that this somewhat notable, somewhat established uh, artist uh, pays absolutely nothing for music and engages with it heavily. Uh, and that's the uh, interesting thing in that access is more important than ownership to so many people. John. Right. And would actually prefer the better quality, whether analog or, or digital. And many don't download because that's too complicated. Got it. Um, Got it. So it's a, it's a slightly different audience. It doesn't mean what you're saying isn't true at all. Sure. That sure. There are other places. Sure. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, I definitely want to talk about that because despite the uh, dirt shoveling on the grave of the compact disc, uh, we still ship thousands of them every day. And uh, there is an audience for them, and there are a lot of buyers for them. So, um, so for instance, uh, we own a retail uh, company called Archive Music. It may be uh, familiar to some of you as a place to buy classical music CDs, kind of an Amazon for, for classical. Um, CD, DVD, uh, uh, vinyl, and any available format, but specific to classical music. We also run Archive Jazz, which is specific to that uh, genre. Uh, we do, you know, decent business, very good business through that, catering to folks like you, to the collectors, the people that care about sound, that care about format, that care about their library and sortation and organization and, uh, and great sound. Um, the, uh, of course, you know, in addition to that, we have some mail order catalogs, and of, and of course we sell to the behemoth uh, in the world of physical commerce of any kind, and that's Amazon. Uh, Amazon is far and away our biggest and most complicated physical partner, digital partner too, um, and uh, we spend a lot of time and a lot of resources because so many people are comfortable utilizing Amazon as the place to shop for all of their needs. Uh, if you're a Prime member, you know that Prime gives you all kind of access to free shipping. If you live in New York City, uh, it can often mean same day, which is mind-blowing to me. Um, if you live in the five boroughs anyway, um, you know, it means access to, you know, all the original content and films and, and things like that. Amazon in the coming years will put a lot more emphasis on, uh, on the areas of away from their physical business, physical business of any kind, including books, to all of their digital businesses. And uh, it's the biggest and probably most complex company and, and organization in human history. They have their uh, hands on everything. Yeah. License streaming? You mean licensing as a part, uh, as opposed to uh, availability on streaming? Yes. On the stream? Yeah. So um, a big part of our revenue now is in licensing. Bigger portion now than ever before. I don't know exactly the percentage at this time, but our biggest growth area is in licensing. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one, we can clear pretty quickly. So, for instance, the last 10 or 11 Woody Allen films have utilized, uh, you know, Noxos or Noxos distributed recordings. And the music supervisor uh, of the films calls us up. We can generally clear music in a matter of uh, days, if not hours, uh, where the major label competitors that we have uh, might hash back and forth about you know, fees and contracts and things like that that could take weeks. Uh, and not only that, you know, you have that at the, the sort of larger area. And then uh, we also have a business in micro-licensing. Micro-licensing is a business for the student film composer who might be at a college or university. Uh, we do a lot with the NYU film uh, program. Um, that they've scored or that they've created some five-minute film for their, uh, for their student film, for their project and they want a bit of classical music and a background of some scene like that, and they need to learn how to license it. It's part of, uh, part of what you need to do as a, as a filmmaker. Um, we can clear licenses like that through a self-service website called Noxus Licensing, uh, and it's all entirely self-serve, and we, we take a fee for finding the right music for that. The student can overlay the music on the film, 
in real time and make determinations if they want to have a Haydn string quartet, make comparative performances uh, overlaid on their film. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, okay, good. Um, <clears throat> So uh, as you see here, I mean, we've got some, you know, revenue opportunities. I talk a bit about social media, um, but I want to talk about uh, some of the physical formats as they exist now. Uh, so of course we have the compact disc. We have the super audio disc, SACD, um, which uh, we do have some very, very large labels dedicated to that, like BIS, like Shandos, like Pentatone, uh, legendary and large independent record labels committed to classical music and committed to great sound. Uh, through SACD. Um, of course, we also have vinyl. And uh, vinyl, if you follow the business, I'm not talking about the classical music part of it, but the business overall uh, has been a big, big bright spot in the world of physical sales. Uh, vinyl uh, sales have increased over 300% each of the last five years. Um, now, they came from nothing, so it's not as impressive as it sounds. And even the best-selling vinyl record in the 21st century hasn't yet sold 100,000 units. Um, so uh, it's still a, a, a niche, and in the classical world, it's a niche within a niche. Um, I elected to do my last record on vinyl. It's available as download. It's available to stream as well. Um, but um, I've really kind of reacquainted myself, and I got a new turntable, and I got a new system, and I've really fallen in love again with how it started for me, putting on a record, uh, the sort of... Um, ritual of putting the needle on the groove and having the thing play is, is, is very exciting for me and just, you know, great sound uh, is always important to me too. Um, so there, you know, there are these different formats. Within the digital sphere, um, the audiophile is not left out of, uh, you know, out, out in the cold. So we've mentioned some of the, uh, you know, poor uh, quality sound that comes from YouTube, MP3 quality sound, highly compressed. Um, you have the same if you utilize any of the services, um, Apple Music, Deezer, Spotify, Cobas, any of the other uh, services that exist throughout the world. Um, but then you have a lot of high-res audio sites. So high-res audio, Eonkyo, HD Tracks here in New York, just down the street. Um, a variety of services dedicated to great sound and lossless or higher resolution quality for the digital age. Uh, that is the fastest growing segment within the digital, outside of licensing, within the digital uh, ecosystem of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, and I find it very, very interesting. Uh, the problem is uh, keeping up with the delivery of the content. Uh, when you're talking digital music, you need a pipeline to carry out digital data. And when you have a higher quality sound file, you need a bigger pipe. And uh, the pipe has to be cleared on both ends, just like your plumbing in your sink. And uh, it's just a matter of uh, the serv uh, us delivering to the services and then the services ingesting, uh, which has been kind of big and kind of problematic. And it's taken a bit of time, uh, though I do, I am pretty encouraged that some of these services uh, will probably be bigger in the coming years. Um, but it's just a matter of, you know, how it is, uh, how people will want to listen to and consume music. And if you ask, the, say, the 22-year-old college student who's walking the halls out there with their earbuds in and their iPhone, uh, what you're listening to, and you put those earbuds in your ears and it sounds like crap, um, and you ask that person, are you satisfied with what you're listening to there, chances are they're going to say yes, unless presented with another option. And um, you know the, the, these computers of unbelievable processing power that we carry with us every day in our pockets and purses uh, have access to the world's music. And how do you compete with the world's music and how do you compete with free? Those are the two biggest things uh, that the classical music record industry uh, has to deal with. Um, one of the ways that we deal with it uh, is the subject of curation. Um, curation is uh, is a word generally used for the library world. Gary, you would know this, that every month through your newsletter, you know, you curate and recommend particular classical recordings that would be of interest to your particular customer base. Uh, we do that too in a variety of, of ways. Uh, we do a lot more on the digital side. Uh, we do it through our uh, weekly newsletters through Archive Music. Uh, we market direct to a mail order customer 
through a physically mailed catalog. We do one for classical, one for jazz, one for uh, roots music and oldies. Um, and I never would have thought this when we uh, took over our, uh, another company for mail order. Um, I should have brought you some actual physical catalogs. Uh, our company is called Classical Music Superstore. Um, that a catalog mailed to a person, a person who has no record store within a, you know, a million miles of them, when presented something in that catalog, might actually buy it. And not only will they buy it, they're not shopping online comparing prices. They will pay full price or sometimes, in many cases, more than full price for the convenience of having something mailed to them. Uh, so every day if you walk in the door of Knoxville of America in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, there's a little um, mail stacker thingy on the, on the top of the, one of the desks. And in there are a bunch of checks. And those checks are for $10, $20, $30. Uh, and those are people that uh, throughout the day have sent in checks to order one or two or three CDs from our mail order catalog, uh, which we obviously ship out and fill for them. Um, yeah. You guys, can you pass that mic around? Oh, sure. Sure. There's a similar phenomenon when you go to the concerts and you provide people with the artist's CDs at far more than they can get it online, but the impulse buy tends to, it's right there, it, they're hearing the artists, and so it's, they sell quite well at concerts, and that's, that's a similar type of situation to what you're talking about. That's right, that's right, and uh, we feel very strongly about that, so our concert sales division is, is part of what I do. We started that uh, area about, must have been five or six years ago, uh, to fulfill exactly what you're talking about, John, uh, and that's uh, the, the, the fact that there is no real replacement to from hearing a great concert, walking out of there at one of the many institutions here and finding a CD in a library with somebody willing to sell it to you. Uh, we handle roughly 450 concerts a year on behalf of our artists from Lang Lang and Yo-Yo Ma uh, on down to, you know, whatever struggling pianist in Brooklyn or uh, whoever they may be uh, handling concert sales for their uh, shows. It's a very expensive business for us, uh, but it's one that's very meaningful to the labels, to the artists, and to the consumers. Um, it is very, very attractive. So when we, um, when the record store was really being threatened about 10 years ago, you know, we looked at it and, and you know, looked ahead to the day when we wouldn't have them or have very many of them, at least in, in the US and Canada, uh, and realized and recognized the fact that the classical music consumer, including the physical consumer, is not going to go away when the stores leave. Um, we need to find a way to reach those people. So we bought archive music from Steinway, the piano maker. Uh, we bought our mail order catalog business. We started our concert sales division to handle uh, exactly that. and. Um, and there's a good, good business. Like I said, we still ship thousands of packages uh, every day to classical music lovers. Any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry to be monopolizing your time. Um, is there any business for Noxos at this point in reissue of older recordings anywhere in the, anywhere in the world? I know you're still putting out a handful of titles, but my sense is that you're moving away from that. Is that accurate? The Noxos label. Well, not, even, not specifically the Noxos label, but yes, that would be included. Anything that would be considered a historical reissue. Um, we do hundreds every year. Um, we handle the distribution of Sony Classical, just so you know. You may not be aware of that, but yeah. Um, so all of the reissues that come to, you know, with the Bernstein stuff that has come out um, over the, especially this year, in the Bernstein year, we handle uh, all the many reissues, some of which is the result of your work uh, over the years, uh, now through Sony Masterworks, we handle the distribution for. Um, we also handle universal music, so that's DECA, Deutsche Grammophon, and ECM, uh, but on a non-exclusive basis. I can't sell them everywhere, um, and, it, and it's really a very, very small uh, mix of customers, uh, and, you know, DG and DECA, as you know, are doing loads and loads of historic reissues at deeper and deeper discounts. Um, we did uh, distribute Warner Classics for a time too, not any longer. Um, so 
between the three major record labels, we do handle the distribution of it, but we don't, Noxos as a label is generally not, not dealing in reissues. So, Gary. Uh, you might also mention the labels that are resulting now from rediscoveries of archival material by various radio broadcasting stations like the Southwest German Radio and Profil, which is mm -hmm. primarily Dresden and Leipzig mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and in many cases, superior to what has been around on some of the unofficial historic labels. Great point, great uh, point. And is now uh, being located and issued, unlike uh, the problems that you had in the past where it had to be uh, somebody's tape made on a $99 Pentron mm -hmm. uh, because it was the only available one of that material. That's right, that's right. So uh, Germany uh, presents a very interesting case because um, Germany obviously is a very culturally culturally rich country for a lot, what we're talking about here, uh, Central Europe being kind of the sort of uh, epicenter of, of classical music discovery from antiquity uh, to the present. And uh, Germany presents a very, very interesting uh, case of a country that if you divide it into four quadrants, uh, each of the four quadrants has a consortium of uh, radio and television broadcasters, um, and the SWR, or Southwest Radio, Southwest German Radio, uh, based in Stuttgart, uh, is a good example of one of those quadrants. And um, you know, each of those um, each of those consortia, um, you know, receive a lot of money, a lot of funding over the years uh, to make available uh, recordings that they had never necessarily issued, but had broadcast at some point in the past. Uh, and many of these are very fine recordings, as, as you said. Uh, the SWR is an archive that we ended up, we, Noxos, the label, uh, bought. And um, there's a load of great jazz and great classical recordings made over many decades. Uh, the Hensler and Profil labels, uh, two labels owned by one individual, uh, Gunter Hensler, um, have concentrated a lot of their stuff uh, all, also in the southwest part of Germany, uh, but also in Saxony, in Dresden, in Leipzig. And uh, so that's with the uh, Dresden Staatskapelle and the many fine recordings over various conductors there, um, Kurt Sanderling and uh, Klaus Tenstedt and uh, Christian Thielmann, and uh, a lot of very, very fine uh, conductors and a lot of recordings come out of, of those areas and of course the Leipzig Gewandhaus too. Um, Germany presents a very interesting case in that uh, of all the markets in the world who have seen drastic declines in physical sales, the US market has seen declines in physical sales of between 15 and 20 percent each of the last 10 years. Each of the last 10 years, that's how drastic the drop is. Germany is the one country in the world that has a hot air balloon keeping it elevated above it. So um, Japan is the other one. Uh, Japan is very strong. You know, Tower Records, which left uh, the US market now 10 years ago, is alive and well in Japan with 63 stores. Um, at least the name, it's not the company, but they, you know, they license the name and use it there. Japan has 63 stores. Physical sales are still strong in Japan and in Germany. If you spent any time in Germany uh, and you've been to Berlin, you would know Dusmann. And in, uh, and in Munich, it's uh, Bex. Both of those stores, the absolute hearts of their respective cities, uh, they ha maintain some of the largest and most coveted real estate in each city. Uh, they have enormous classical music sections, entire floors, exactly what we would have had at 68th and Broadway, 72nd and Broadway, on and on. Uh, and, um, and physical sales is, is still relatively strong in Germany uh, until this year. Uh, this year saw a big decline, um, and I think we'll probably see, see more, of course, as, as, you know, as the business evolves. Uh, but it's still a very strong physical market. And it's not just for music there. Uh, the culture really kind of emphasizes uh, a lot of specialty 
anything. France does too. People go to one store for the bread, one for the cheese, one for the household goods, one for the music, one for the book, and then they go home. And they've just made five purchases without ever going online uh, or ever you know, dealing with the sort of uh, the, the, the digital life that so many Americans do. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, about, does that answer your question, Gary? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Um, a little bit on the, on the digital side. So our um, Noxus was founded 31 years, of, years ago uh, by a Hong Kong entrepreneur named Klaus Heyman. He's my boss. He still runs the company. He still owns the company. We are based in Hong Kong. We have offices in various cities, um, in a few different cities throughout the world, either regional head offices or we work with local distributors in various countries, um, such as Greece or Italy or Russia, uh, to make our music available. And um, Klaus, uh, I think most of you in the room know that when he entered the uh, industry, uh, he was 51 years old. Um, he had already been successful in another industry. His partner in that other industry was Armand Bose, uh, maker and creator of the Bose speaker system. And Klaus Heyman was the first distributor of Bose products in Asia. Um, and he started during the Vietnam War selling hi-fi equipment to uh, American troops uh, stationed in Vietnam and Laos. Um, he later, he's a uh, German, German businessman, but moved to Hong Kong uh, back in the, I believe, early 60s, maybe mid-60s, uh, where he's been ever since. And um, when he started Noxos uh, 31 years ago, um, his goal was to really take on the major label uh, hegemony of classical music recordings because he uh, was a classical music recording collector, a very avid one, had an enormous collection on vinyl for many years, and he started a label uh, called Marco Polo to focus on out-of-the-way repertoire uh, at mid-price, and then a label called Noxos to focus on various elements of repertoire. The very first couple of years, it was the standard repertoire, and I think he would admit some of those recordings are not exactly the best work that we've ever done, uh, but we focused on getting a lot of the works, the Chopin piano literature and the Beethoven quartets and things like that recorded. Uh, but over time, the Noxus label uh, became dedicated uh, to, um, to repertoire. So A&R, Artists and Repertoire, um, is a you know, segment of the record business that's existed probably from its inception. Um, and it's not one that's talked about as much now, though everybody likes to think that they can discover great talent. I like to think that I can, but I cannot. Um, and um, Klaus's vision at the time was to focus on the R, on the repertoire. And whereas the major labels were focusing on artists and relationships with artists and developing people who go out and perform, and things like that, uh, he realized, recognized, he felt that it was hard to compete with, uh, with that, with the infrastructure that he had at the time. So he was gonna focus on repertoire and often making the first or only available recording uh, of a particular uh, work or composer's work. So 13,000 recordings later, um, that's largely what Noxos does. Uh, we have many, many world premiere, I don't even know the percentage of our catalog, at least 60% are world premiere recordings. Um, many of them might be a second recording or a third or a recording of a work that's long out of print. Um, and uh, you may not, may or may not be surprised that some of our biggest recordings are, are those works. Um, competing with Beethoven string quartets with some of the great, great uh, recordings uh, that have been released over the decades is a pretty hard business to compete with. Um, so uh, in the, in the um, ascendancy of the CD era in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the Noxos business uh, grew and grew to the point that nearly any large record store, certainly classical music department, had that sort of sea of white covers. So if you went to Tower Records at 66 and Broadway, uh, when I moved here and I went into that place, I thought it was absolute heaven uh, to walk into this place. Of course, I worked for a competing company at the time. I worked for BMG. Uh, but they had, then the Noxos hat was the only label that had its own section of white covers alphabetized uh, by composer. Uh, other than Germany and Japan, there are no real stores that have that now uh, in the world. Um, but that was, you know, a, a real opportunity for us to, uh, to create uh, original recordings of under-recorded or unrecorded repertoire, 
and available at a good price. The second great thing that happened, I think, was the digitization of our catalog, which started in 1996. So in 1996, um, the internet was pretty much in its fledgling state. We were all emailing. We were probably online. I think that was the year I started becoming an Amazon customer, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Klaus had the idea of converting all of our catalog into what would later become the MP3, a compressed audio file uh, able to be shared uh, throughout the world. And uh, long before there was a market for it, or well, a legal market for it, there was certainly an illegal one for many years in the early file sharing days of the late, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but he digitized and you know, um, put a whole team of musicologists on the task of cataloging all of what we have. Um, we have musicologists here in New York, in Nashville, in Hong Kong, and our largest concentration of them, which is in Manila, in the Philippines. And um, cataloging a vast catalog and repository of data of classical music recordings, both ours and others, and digitizing our own catalog. In 2003, iTunes launched, and there was one classical label on the site on the day they launched, and that was us. Those were really, really great days. A lot of people caught up very fast. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, iTunes was, and still is, the, the sort of dominant download player uh, in the world. Um, we've since uh, launched, a year after that, the Noxos Music Library. So if you have someone my age or older, uh, do, you know the, do you know the name Noxos? What does it mean to you? Uh, they'll say that sea of white covers that they remember from Tower Records uh, on the Upper West Side. Uh, for anybody who's 30 and younger, um, Noxus is known as the Noxus Music Library, this thing that they accessed while they were in school. Every, nearly every college, university, and conservatory program in North America, and many of them in other territories throughout the world, accesses Noxus recordings and most of the world's classical music recordings through our own proprietary streaming service called Noxus Music Library. Um, MP3 quality, uh, also SECD quality through the site as well for those that are willing to pay for it. Uh, it is not a consumer service that all of us would have access to unless you're affiliated with a college or university. If you're a professor, if you're a student, if you're an administrator at a school or a music professional in the world, NML is available to you. Um, it's now 13 years old. Uh, it is far and away our uh, probably best known brand uh, throughout the world. And uh, at this point, most of the world's classical music recordings, and uh, we're at about 2.6 million tracks, if I'm not mistaken, or well over 2,000 labels, including all the majors, uh, on the service. So what it is, is a, um, it works on a uh, concurrent user basis, and it's a license that colleges and universities uh, utilize uh, based on the number of concurrent users. So when I was in music school, you were studying whatever, 14th century madrigals. You had to go to the library, you had to check out the scratchy record or cassette. You had to listen, study, learn about madrigals that way and you know bone up for a test. Nowadays, if you're a professor, you log into NML, you create your playlist from all of the available recordings there. That playlist is shared with all of your students. All of those students have access to it say the Juilliard School, and they listen and they study and they use the resource materials on Noxus Music Library uh, for, their, um, for their classes. Yeah? Uh, it's not based on concurrent users, as I understand. It's based on the number of people who have access to it. Yes, which the university or the institution Correct. controls. Correct. It's based on FTE. So if you're at a university with 36,000 FTE, you're paying for 36,000 potential users. You're not paying for the several hundred who may actually be using it. I mean, that's the way it works now. Maybe from that end of things, but we pay, we do licenses in the increments of 100, generally. So... Oh, I, I'm not saying your prices are, are out of, I mean, your prices are very reasonable given what we get for it. That's yeah. no question. But you just said it was based on concurrent users. And it's not based on concurrent users. It's based on an FTE equivalent in the institution. Got it. Got it. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. What we do is we monitor the number of concurrent users and the turnaways that come from those. So if an institution has a 50 user license and the 51st person logs in, they get a turnaway notice. Can't log in at this time, please try later. And then we monitor the number of turnaways throughout the year so that when a renewal comes up with an institution, we go back to them and say, hey, you had X amount of turnaways over the last 12 months. Maybe you want to jump up to the next increment. That's Don't how we, we just do. go for the full FTE. You do the, do the full? That's great. That's great. Is that here? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Um, so Noxus Music Library, it's a big and uh, still growing uh, concern for us. We also have Noxus Video Library, uh, which isn't quite as successful. Um, and, you know, we can talk about classic music video and Blu-ray if you'd like as well. Uh, that's a whole other world that's uh, seeing a lot of downward pressure. Um, and, of course, competing with YouTube, again, is, is, the, big, uh, is the big changer for, for so many of us in, in this business. Um, Ivan, Gavin, questions? Yeah. Uh, when SACD came out, Noxos uh, started recording SACDs and then sort of dropped it. Mm -hmm. uh, do they still record in that mode and keep it in a vault somewhere, or we do, have and we they make, given it up? We know? haven't given it up altogether. We make them available digitally, uh, so we do have a lot of what well, we've just a generic term, uh, high res audio you know, higher, higher resolution audio that we make available for digital services. So it's only in download? Only download or streaming. Okay. So, um, but that's not to say that we don't do SACD, you know, recordings. Um, we have a lot of labels that do. Yeah. Um, and for a while, we were also, if you remember, doing DVD audio. So Klaus was very high on DVD audio. And um, I was too, as an audiophile I was. So we first... Uh, we demoed it in a couple of places, uh, the, where, uh, if you know Innovative Audio Visual down on 58th Street, I think it's 58th Street, and you know some of the largest and most expensive systems in the world. Uh, we presented uh, John Corleano's Circus Maximus, which was one of the first DVD audio recordings that we did uh, with the composer and the publisher and you know a, a, a bunch of press. This was about seven or eight years ago now. Uh, and I thought the sound was absolutely astounding. And Klaus felt even stronger about DVDA than he did about SACD, uh, but the market just never, never took to it. And, um, you know, so Blu-ray audio, though some do it, and we have some Blu-ray audio still, it's a very, very tough market. You know, throughout the world, the numbers are so, so small, and the manufacturing costs are quite high. So, yeah. Based on my experience, the institutional market tends to go by price in some areas. They will buy, given a choice of SACD at a slightly higher price and normal recording mm -hmm. at a lower price or the normal price, they will go with the normal recording any time. Yeah. The same thing with uh, DVD versus Blu-ray audio, uh, Blu-ray video. video. And Blu-ray audio is, of course, way, way out of line in terms of pricing. Right. Uh, and I think you also have some of that in the downloading in that area where we do. there is a yeah. difference in price. Yeah, we do. It's much more expensive. Yeah. So uh, the other experience I've had is that there are price limits uh, that the institutional market and the individual collectors seem to go by. They are not tempted by big boxes at $2 per CD. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there is the $20 upper limit. I've noticed that sales will fall off by 20%. The minute a CD goes from 1999 to 2001. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah. Similar experience to what we have. So um, putting a, a, blue, uh, a different format like Blu-ray audio into circulation in a library would be suicide for a librarian because someone's going to check it out, take it home, stick it in their CD player, and they're going to come out with a bunch of, of garbage. Um, and that's not the patron experience that the library wants to give the person. So that's kind of negated. And then the other thing is a massive box set at $2 a disc. And somebody checks that giant thing out, brings it home, listens to the whole thing, and they return it, and disc 48 is missing. You know, that's not going to be a good thing for the, for the next person who checks it out, too. So, yeah, yeah, we find that as well. I have another question hmm. regarding the permanence of the downloads. Hmm. What happens if a subscriber drops the subscription? What happens to their downloads? Yeah. Depends on the service. Um, you know, so the Apple ecosystem, um, at this point, everything r will reside for you or should in the cloud, provided you're continuing to throw stuff up there and pull it down later if you get another device. Um, that's not a fail-safe way. And I would caution anybody who wishes to store all of their music on the servers of big tech. Big tech, you know what I'm talking about. I shouldn't even say them out loud, but big tech is, you know, responsible for all the information that they're collecting on us at any given time, including your listening habits. And if you want to rely on them to be the sortation system for all of what you love in the genre of classical music, you have to understand that uh, just like your house or apartment or whatever, they're subject to uh, technological things and natural disasters and anything else. So uh, you can lose your stuff. I've lost uh, recordings that I've downloaded in the early days of iTunes. I'm not really sure where they went. I've gotten new computers over the years and, and what have you, and I'm not really sure where they've gone. So um, I caution anyone against that. Bring us forward to the world of streaming and the services used, whether it's Noxus Music Library through an institution, Apple Music, Spotify, Deezer, any of the other services, YouTube, uh, and we talk about how you know the youth of this world, uh, to them, ownership is a lot less important than access, being able to uh, dip your toe in. And they call it streaming uh, because you never kind of dip your toe in the same river twice. And so um, where is the opportunity? Where does classical music fall into that? And where is the opportunity? Um, there is a tremendous upside. Now, for those of us who have been here a long time, we can certainly cry and lament the days of walking into Tower Records with knowledgeable clerk and being recommended some recordings and walking out of there and having a good experience. Some of those guys are pretty crazy. It might not have been a great experience, but you know what I mean. Uh, and you know, you come home and suddenly you've started a collection. Like me, I've got thousands of recordings on my wall. And uh, I listen to them all the time. I file them and catalog them carefully so I can find them. And uh, I share them with my family, I share them with friends. It's very much of a, you know, a, 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 just a natural part of my daily musical diet. Um, but I also stream a lot. I also access a lot of music uh, in all the ways that, that we talked about here. And in the world of streaming, um, classical music, this is a very interesting stat. I probably shouldn't even share it or say who it came from, uh, but it came from one of the big three tech companies and their preeminent uh, or primary classical music person at the service who said that classical music has a higher level of engagement as a genre than any other genre besides pop music. That means that if you look at all the different genres of music, so, you know, rap, urban, country, pop, rock, country, um, you know, whatever, bluegrass, folk, classical music has some degree of access by more people, more, more than any genre besides pop. So it just means that those glass doors that existed in the record store that was a real, that was a real barrier for someone who didn't know a whole lot about Haydn string quartets and would be intimidated by walking in that place has been eradicated in the world of streaming. So Spotify and Apple have the world's music there, or most, most of what many people would want, the average consumer would want. Um, and more people are engaging with classical music through the thing that um, some people would say will replant, uh, supplant the album, but I do not agree, not at all. 
um, but it has certainly allowed classical music to be accessed by more people, and that's the playlist. Consider a playlist a mobile album, a flexible album. It will change for you this week, it'll look different for you next week, and a month from now, it might not have any recognition uh, to you than what it did when you started. A playlist is a flexible album in, in many ways, uh, built around a theme or a concept. And it's not limited to number of tracks, it's not limited to time, uh, it's not really limited to anything. It could be one track, it could be a minute, it could be 24 hours long, and the streaming world exists uh, on playlists, on album streams, on track streams, and on playlists. So, what is the, uh, uh, the most listened to playlist on the Spotify ecosystem? Spotify is the largest streaming service in the world. Uh, they have a, um, a today's hits thing, which has whatever the flavor of the, of the day or the week is, uh, which is far and away the most listened to streaming service. The number two, two or three, depending on the week, is called Peaceful Piano. Peaceful Piano has roughly on average 60%, 60 to 70% of its content is classical piano music. Chopin, Mozart, whatever one uh, playlister or a programmer might consider to be peaceful. Um, two and a half million people follow that playlist. Far more people engage with Mozart's piano music through that playlist than all of the Mozart albums probably that exist on the service that draw and feed into that playlist. Yeah? The listeners know what they're listening to. Question is, do the listeners know what they're listening to? That's a very good question. So yes and no. Yes, if you care. And you can look in there, and you can see the metadata behind it. And you can see who's playing it. You see the album cover. You can see um, uh, the particular recording. You can get some data on that. Um, the different services uh, vary a little bit as to what they display. Um, but you're not going to get the rich experience of having the piece in your hand, having the liner notes, uh, getting the biographical information on the artist, say, or the contextualization of the piece. Um, but you do, if you care. So, um, are, there any, are there any statistics on whether people, or what percentage of people actually care? Or are they doing this background music while they cook dinner and they're not paying any attention? Well, that, there's no t statistics that I know of that you know, indicates who really cares to that level and that level of detail. Um, but uh, you touched upon the thing that was where I was going, and that's... Sorry. No, no, perfect. The lifestyle playlist. So just like we had lifestyle albums, lifestyle CDs, you know, at BMG we did these rel relaxation CDs, um, you may remember the only classical CD you ever need, which is not a very good thing for the industry at the time, because it meant that nobody bought the rest of them. Um, but uh, now in the playlisting era, we have uh, the lifestyle playlist. So Peaceful Piano, by its nature, is not something there's probably a real heavy engagement with. It is something, it's music for use. Gibraltar's music, you know? Somebody's doing something else, and they're listening to that. Uh, also within the top five, there's another playlist that is almost 60 to 70 percent classical music, and that's music for studying. Now, music for studying is obviously, you know, intended to be something that's unobtrusive, always non-vocal. Classical music lends itself pretty well to that. Always non-vocal. Um, can be longer tracks. Doesn't need to be some two-minute pop song. Uh, um, something without a, a great dynamic range, so a lot of it's you know compressed and equalized to not be too offensive to those that are studying with earbuds, um, and a huge amount of, of classical music in there. A playlist by its nature has to change. Tracks drop off, they go back on. Um, if you subscribe and you follow a playlist on any of the services, you will get an email if you sign up for that kind of thing or some sort of notification either through your email or through the service, that something has been changed about the playlist that you've been listening to. So come back and listen again. And uh, that is an incredible amount of marketing uh, that is being done to you if you go back and keep listening to Peaceful Piano over and over and over. Um, what does it mean for big tech? Obviously, they're uh, developing an even greater profile on you and your habits. Um, so that you wonder on your phone or you're on Facebook or whatever, 
and you wonder, why am I being marketed to for wine and espresso and high-end cars and all that stuff? I can't afford any of that shit. Well, you're a classical music fan, so they've made a profile that you, certainly you must. And, you know, you do fit this demographic here. You know, male, uh, upwardly mobile, perhaps fixed income, but, uh, you know, a substantial one. And they profile you with the uh, idea of collecting information on you. So the playlisting world, uh, you know, uh, doesn't necessarily exist to serve that purpose. Um, it does exist to keep you listening. And that's why playlists uh, are changing all the time. Um, the services, particularly Spotify and Apple Music, uh, are battling mightily against each other, you know, with uh, collected 60 million users worldwide between the two services, and their growth is not going to stop there. Uh, of course, Apple's public, publicly traded company and a whole lot of businesses, um, and Spotify um, had their first investor meeting this afternoon when they go public uh, in a matter of days or weeks. Um, so we'll probably see some changes there. Uh, but what does it mean for the genre that we know and love is that the engagement has changed a lot. First of all, the demographic is a lot younger. Um, the streaming world skews far higher female at any point in, in, in classical music history, the, at least in the rec uh, recording label history. The high female engagement, rather young, uh, um, uh, mixed incomes or none at all, young students, kids. I have a 13-year-old. Um, he listens to loads and loads and loads of music. He pays for none of it. <laughs> I'm not too happy about it. Um, but when he's online or he's doing whatever and he's listening on SoundCloud or YouTube or whatever uh, in the genres that he likes, he's accessing a lot of music and he listens to a lot of playlists too. Um, so we're looking, uh, as our marketing efforts have changed, um, to not taking out ads in the New York Times, which are ridiculously expensive mm -hmm. and not measurable in terms of their uh, effectiveness. Uh, we do a lot more social media to target, um, target younger people, which is essentially free. Yeah. Um, when you say target younger people, you didn't mention racial demographics. Mm. And classical music tends to skew, at least audience-wise, tends to skew white and Asian. Uh, are, um, African Americans, uh, Latinos, whatever, listening to it at all in these sort of formats? Yes, good question. Um, and yes, and in growing numbers, and especially in the streaming age, we're finding a lot more uh, engagement uh, of a larger group of, of racial demographics. It's still primarily white, um, primarily American, European, Canadian. Uh, Latin America is actually the fastest growing market in the world of streaming, uh, particularly Brazil far and away the largest. Uh, Brazil has virtually no record stores, almost impossible to sell into. Um, we've, um, we at Noxos have, have dedicated at least a bit of uh, the last few years, particularly in Black History Month, which is February, uh, of promoting the work of artists of color. Um, if you know the Sphinx organization, uh, I spoke at their annual convention a couple of weeks ago in Detroit. Uh, Sphinx is dedicated to promoting classical music artists of color uh, to find more performance opportunities uh, and opportunities in general throughout the world. Um, founded in Harlem and based in Detroit, uh, they're uh, a great, great classical music advocacy organization that's only, I think, about 10 years old, maybe less, uh, I think about 10 years old. So yeah, we are finding more, but there's a lot more, there's a lot more marketing and a lot more work to be done in that area. Um, so this lifestyle stuff, for the hardcore collector, person who person who wants to listen to the five symphonies of Arthur Honegger with whatever particular orchestra, whatever particular conductor, whatever particular artist, this is a lot harder world to crack. Uh, this uh, the the not so discerning, laid back customer, to use the term that Pandora uses, and iHeart and Sirius and some of the radio services use the laid back or the lean back user is someone for whom music is. Uh, an accessory, you know, like jewelry. You can do without it, but you like to have it, looks good. And um, the lean back person is not the hardcore collector that we have here among those of us in our room. 
Uh, and that's a real challenge for us. We've had to gear so many of our marketing efforts to a customer that we don't always understand. And, um, you know, you may or may not be surprised that uh, in our company, at least in the American company, I'm one of the older people there. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of people who are a lot more tech savvy than I and um, are dedicated to social media, marketing. They might not have the knowledge or understanding of the sort of history of the business. Uh, they haven't been in it as, as long as I have um, and may not have the understanding of the repertoire and the artists perhaps that someone who's been in it for a little while have. Uh, but they do understand better than I uh, the, the ways in which we engage in music. Um, and I'll just, I guess, conclude on that word engagement um, because that's a word we use a lot, a whole lot is engagement. Um, engagement really refers to um, the consumption of music, um, however it may be consumed. I actually hate the word consumption because it sounds like you know music is a potato chip or something like that, and you can't stop. I wish it were that 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 easy from a marketing perspective. Um, but engagement, me you know, means how do we as individuals interact with music um, if we don't especially if we don't want to pull it off a shelf, buy it, have it part of our budget every month along with your food budget, your laundry budget, your rent and mortgage or whatever, that stuff. You have a certain amount uh, toward uh, music use. Uh, so more and more people are either paying nothing or $10 a month to access much of the world's music and to market to a group that large and amorphous, although one that does engage at a higher level of classical music than the normal 3% market share, genre market share that the, that the format has always pretty much had, almost unchanging uh, for, for 60 or 70 years, um, is something that we as, uh, as an industry and as a, a, a larger ecosystem uh, need to crack. And you know, the part of my mission w within the company when I really got involved in business development is to try to break through some of the barriers of uh, the larger classical music, music ecosystem because for a lot of years there was the record industry and then there were concerts and anything Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center does and there was publicity and there was marketing and there was radio. There were all these different things and none of them really talked to one another and they didn't understand how the others worked. And now we've slowly over time seen the obliteration of all of those things. Have you seen the ability to work much more closely with orchestras? In fact, Noxos has recorded uh, many of uh, American orchestras and the, many of the remaining ones have started their own labels, Chicago, San Francisco, New York just signed with DECA a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, you know, we have a lot of really good things. So how do we you know, raise and develop the sort of classical music ecosystem so that we can enjoy as much music however we wish to enjoy it uh, for the coming years. That's, that's my mission. Questions? Children. Yeah. Recording American orchestras cost a fortune. Hmm. Are they all done uh, on a live basis to save money, of course? Yes. Do uh, are any of the recordings done under, quote, studio conditions in America? They are uh, with a very, very notable uh, reasons, and that studio conditions means Hollywood films. Films are done under studio conditions on sound stages, uh, generally in Hollywood, generally in California, with oodles and oodles of rehearsal time, uh, and because Paramount has a very big budget for such a thing. Outside of film, no. So uh, the interesting development of uh, the, is the live performance complement waiver that was negotiated between the AFFM, American Federation of Musicians, and the League of American Orchestras. It's about 10 years ago now. And the uh, waiver uh, provides a provision, maybe it's more than 10 years ago, maybe it's 12 or so, uh, that uh, recordings can be made if they're recorded under live circumstances. Um, and um, with a very fixed amount of time, and I don't know how much, it's very little, uh, for patching, patch sessions. Uh, so for instance, one of our labels, the Capo, which is the national label of Denmark, uh, came here 
to record the New York Philharmonic several, uh, five years ago. We did a whole Nielsen cycle of the Nielsen symphonies plus the concertos. And uh, the Queen of Denmark came, we sat down with Alan Gilbert and we had tea, we had all this publicity, all this stuff. Um, the same guy who produced my record, Pacifying Weapon, uh, produced those records here in New York. And um, those sessions were done over New York Philharmonic's weekend's worth of concerts, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, with a short patch session on one of those days for 30 minutes or whatever to isolate some parts and work on those. They were later taken back, you know, mixed, shared with the orchestra, and the recording was produced that way. The vast majority of recordings are, are done that way. Um, it's different in Europe, though, uh, especially in Eastern Europe and the former uh, countries behind the Iron Curtain, where it's still possible uh, to make recordings under much uh, more reasonable circumstances. To, I would think to record 30 minutes of music uh, with uh, an orchestra in the US under studio conditions would cost you in the range of a quarter of a million dollars. There's no way in the world you would ever make that money back. <laughs> so. And what does it cost you under life conditions? Uh, well, at the live condition, if, uh, if it's already being performed, there are no costs. The costs are obviously uh, for the label or the orchestra to bring their engineers, to have all their recording equipment there, and to do all of that. At this point, the larger American orchestras, New York, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, Detroit, Buffalo, Nashville, they have their own uh, broadcast you know, booths and systems. Many concerts, you know, I come from Detroit, I worked for the DSO many years ago, and uh, they have a very sophisticated setup. You can literally, after the concerts, watch them uh, after the concert is over, and they're archived on the site forever, or until an earthquake, I suppose. Um, and uh, they're making all of these things available in great sound, um, uh, high resolution cameras, um, and nine to 11 cameras in many cases. So most concerts, at least among the large American and European orchestras, are being recorded. Um, so the costs there are already built in, either because they have their own setup or the costs are just hiring the producer and to do the, uh, to do the recording, engineering, and then editing. So to record the, the Buffalo Philharmonic, for instance, uh, Noxos has to pay something above what the orchestra is already being paid. Unless the orchestra wants to do it themselves, and most of them do. And then you just distribute them? We make it available, we manufacture, first of all. We manufacture, we promote, we market, we distribute the recording throughout the world. Uh, we create the metadata, the underlying track level data for everything on that recording. Um, and that is disseminated out to all of our digital partners, DSPs, throughout the world. Um, so, you know, the question sometimes comes up is that how does Noxos do it so cheaply and others do not? Well, at this point, a lot of others do it as well. Uh, there are far more recording projects and proposals than we or an industry could ever possibly tackle. Even if we said yes to everyone, yes, 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 um, there wouldn't necessarily be the commercial viability to do them. Um, and the vast majority of the proposals that we would get, including some of the biggest stars in the world who you would know are come to labels free and clear. Uh, in other words, they're being financed in some other way. Um, that's not to say there's not a lot of costs that labels uh, bring, bring to the equation, they do, uh, but many of those costs aren't done at the actual recording sessions like they were for the first 80, 90 years of the industry. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. John? I would yeah. assume the same sort of thing in terms of less expensive recording applies to the Far East now, since you've started doing quite a bit in China. That is true. With the Hong Kong Philharmonic we work with, yeah. uh, and in China, um, costs are coming down. We don't work, uh, Noxus label doesn't work too much in making recordings in China, uh, that we have opened a Noxus China office. Um, in Beijing just two years ago. Um, China obviously is the, the largest potential music market in the world with a billion people. Um, piracy is rampant there. We keep CDs out of the country 
Uh, if you're going to build a wall, that would be a good place to put one. If you want to keep CDs out of there, um, our our music in China is almost uh, solely digital. Uh, there is a good opportunity there, but uh, we don't uh, work there. There are some interesting developments in other parts of the world, uh, like uh, Qatar, the Middle East nation. Um, is uh, so the Qatar Foundation. Uh, is an enormous foundation. They're so big, they, they sponsor the, the jerseys of the largest soccer club in the world, in Spain, uh, Barcelona. And um, the Cotter Foundation is a, you know, a, a foundation with a bunch of oil money, and they have built pr arguably the largest performing arts complex in the world. It's two years old. They have state-of-the-art recording facilities there. Um, they have lured some of the major players of the uh, American and European orchestras to play for the Cotter Philharmonic. They do classical and pops concerts there for the people that live in Doha. And um, they have a um, recording arts complex with a dozen sound stages. They're equipped to do Hollywood films. I think you'll hear a lot more from them in the coming, uh, coming few years. They're really kind of getting going now. But, and I think we'll probably see a lot more from China doing these similar things. So, John, you had a question? Back in the day, before either of us were born, there were what were called prestige projects. Projects that were done that the company in question either never thought they'd make their money back or they thought they'd make their money back over a long catalog life. Do those things exist anymore at all where somebody does something where it's already known, it's sort of in effect like a loss leader or mm. anything of that nature, or is that completely in the past? Uh, no, it's not past. In fact, I would almost argue that um, it's as prevalent now as it was then. Uh, some of my colleagues might say a lot of what we do <laughs> are prestige projects because we don't make money on them. Um, that, you know, we like the idea or we love the music and we do it. Uh, Klaus is a, is a huge music lover, and as I think you know, his wife is a very well-known violinist, Takako Nishisaki. Um, and she's made uh, many dozens of recordings for Noxos and Marco Polo labels over the years. And um, when they met and fell in love, it was as a result of Klaus's love of classical music that he you know, heard her perform and, uh, and you know, really wanted to explore some of the cornerstones of the, or, or sort of byways of the repertoire uh, that she was playing a lot of. Um, a lot of people would say that a lot of what the Noxus label does are prestige projects because we want to work uh, with a particular artist or particular organization uh, without the, uh, the ability to make a lot of money on that. Um, and you couple that with the fact that the, uh, and I won't go into bore everybody with the details of, of um, revenue structures in the world of streaming, except to say that a stream roughly nets somebody about a third of a cent, whereas a CD sale uh, makes somebody a few dollars at least. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some prestige things that I think um, some labels are doing because they want to, you know, work with, with someone, I, I would th I'd say in some ways, like some of the um, artist-led and orchestra-led labels uh, are doing some of those things because their music director really wants to put his stamp on Beethoven and we're all like, oh, another Beethoven, really? Um, like, you know, it, it's hard with so much competition out there that, you know, when someone wants to do that. Um, but they feel like they have to do it. And um, so um, there's, there's a bit of that. But I know what you mean. Like, you know, back in the day, you know, especially 40s, 50s, 60s, you saw a lot of that. Maybe 70s. A lot of the operas, a lot of Horowitz's recordings were done that way. Right. They knew in advance, especially when he'd choose... Uh, relatively obscure repertoire, like at that time Clementi and Scriabin, they Fire. knew they were going to lose money. Right. And they accepted that that was part of the deal. Right. It was worth having his name attached to the label. Right. But a lot of the operas that were done were done that way as well, even though they were done on, relatively on the cheap. That's true. That's true. Uh, we own a label in uh, Italy called Dynamic, and Dynamic focuses on uh, Italian repertoire, particularly opera. And there's a lot of uh, Donizetti opera, a lot of bel canto era stuff, but not the big hits, not the ones the Met, you know, does every bloody year. It's the ones you've never heard of because it had one performance in Turin 
in 1840, and, uh, and they've done a second one <laughs> in the last few years, and it's been recorded and we've made it available. You might say that those are, you know, boutique or vanity or something like that. We don't have an opportunity to make a whole lot of money on that. But then again, I look at it and I say like, do we need another Lucia? Do we need another Carmen? Could you imagine a world where the Met Opera didn't program Carmen in any year? There's no such year. It happens every year. Or a, or a Bohème or a Traviata, the other two that get, get, get uh, produced every year. So, um, you know, for those of us that really like to explore the byways of repertoire, thank God for vanity and uh, boutique type things like this, prestige projects uh, that allow us to explore a few other things. <laughs> Give it to Gary. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll bring it up to you. Do you have any, uh, do you ever go out for like subscriptions? You know, like say you want to do an issue and go and look for patrons that would uh, subsidize, say, an issue? Uh, subscription in what way? Well, like Marston does. You know, it's like he wants to put something out and he asks people to subscribe and always put the money up front to get the production done. Right, right. For the thank you and the booklet type thing. Uh, we as a label have done it. A lot of our labels do do that. Mm -hmm. So kind of like old-fashioned crowdfunding, crowdsourcing things. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you look on the back side of CDs nowadays, you'll see this on uh, Shandos and things like that. Shandos is a as you may know, a great 30-year-old legendary um, label founded by Brian Cousins, now run by, by his son, Ralph. Uh, and they've done such an amazing catalog of great music, English music and other throughout the years. Uh, they're working a lot in Norway with the Bergen Philharmonic. Uh, Norway is an oil-rich country as well. And you look on the backside of a CD and you see a lot of logos from an, a lot of other um, organizations. A lot of recordings are subsidized that way. Have you ever had a patron come like, who is it? The the um, who is the one who uh, sponsored the Metna recordings on HMV? Does anyone remember? Oh, the, the, uh, the Mirage and Mysore. Yeah, the Mirage. Do you have any Mirages of Mysore uh, coming to, to you? To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how HMV in the late '40s put out every every piece that Metna ever uh, composed at that time. Got it. Do you have anything like that going? No Maharajas that I know of, <laughs> but there might be uh, a shake or two. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that, that's the other thing. I go into this whole thing, but like, you know, so much of the industry mm. and maybe so much of classical music and maybe so much of music in general uh, is subsidized by OPM, other people's money. Um, Max, Max Bialystok, other people's money. Other people's money, yeah. Right. And... Uh, you know, so where it comes from, if it comes from a foundation, an individual, the recording that you heard there uh, was made possible, in my case, by the generosity of a handful of patrons that I courted, that I know. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't have done it on my own. I couldn't have paid for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, that's the way so many of them are made. How are you concerning reissuing classical records? Is that kind of like dribbled down to a few every year or? Of records? Of historic, I meant. Of historic stuff, yeah, you know, pre, uh, Noxos, pre pre LP or even early LP. On the Noxos label, we are not uh, contractually allowed to sell the Noxos historical line within the United States. That we know, but you know I, but, are, but are they still manufacturing any issues of mm -hmm. any sort? They are. Yeah, you'll find them in Gramophone, mm -hmm. in BBC Music. There but they're few. not of they're not of the quantity that they were no. in, the, in the heyday. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, they're just not as strong a market for it now. Mm -hmm. Though, coupled with that, we have a lot of labels that are digging up. I think, John or Gary, you had asked about, you know, reissues, um, you know, mm -hmm. that had been, been coming over the last several years. And there's a lot of stuff from radio broadcasts, particularly the German broadcasting organizations like the SWR, mm -hmm. uh, the Bayer Richard Rundfunk in, in Bavaria, uh, mm -hmm. and on and on. The archives there are deep and long and very, very interesting. Yeah. Really good stuff. Yeah. I have a question about the formats on your recorder concerto. Uh, why not CD? Good question. Good question. Why not CD on my record, A Pacifying Weapon? So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that. I'll embarrass the, uh, a couple of people. Um, 
So Mikola Petri commissioned three American composers to write concertos for her. Uh, the other two besides me are uh, Roberto Sierra and Michael Doherty. I was the first to get the work done. <laughs> And I didn't really want to wait around until those guys, who are, I guess, much busier than I am in completing commissions, um, wrote their works. And uh, it wasn't me. It was actually Michelo who came up with the idea. What about an LP with just your work on it and then a CD reissue, or issued later with the other two works? And I said, sounds great to me. You know, I'd be you know, happy to sell uh, a vinyl only and, and digital release and market it the best that I can. It's gotten some very good press, I'm, I'm happy to say, um, but it does limit big time its uh, saleability. You know, it's not something libraries are gonna carry, most likely, right? So. Your digital release, what format is it in for that? Uh, MP3 available through download and streaming anywhere music is sold. Just MP3, not a, not a better sounding. Uh, 2496 as well, um, if available though not everywhere. We're just backlogged with delivery in some cases, but I think it's on HD Tracks, uh, if you know them, sure. David Chesky's company, and uh, Pro Studio Masters, and I believe Eonkyo. Um, so 2496 and MP3 quality, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, You're determined to break my arm. <laughs> On the uh, sleeve of the LP, <coughs> it says recorded in DV DXD format. Mm -hmm. What is that? DXD is another, um, boy, I should really know how to explain this, but I don't. Uh, it's, another, um, it's another level of lossless, if I understand it, higher resolution quality. So we recorded this in the Royal Danish Conservatory um, hall with, uh, with the orchestra there and Mikola playing and a whole load of microphones. And uh, so DXD is uh, another audio format to, audiophiles would certainly argue this with me ad nauseum, maybe you would, uh, you know, um, about the merits of the quality of it. Um, there are other DXD recordings out there. The problem is that there aren't too many services that deliver digital files in DXD. They're very large. They take a long time to transfer to you if you do download it. Uh, and my crappy internet at home, it would probably take 24 hours to receive my own album in DXD. Uh, and I don't have the equipment uh, to, to enjoy it. Another question, does Naxos have a quote list price on the, on the label? Uh, yeah, on the classical label. Yeah, so Noxos list price is $9.99 or €9.99 or £9.99. Um, we have made some exceptions to that and that there's a pretty large part of the catalog, which is $12.99. Um, and most of the $12.99 stuff is unduplicated repertoire. So we used to be just a budget label. Uh, and now we've got a couple of different price tiers. And then, of course, we have some individually priced items that are a great seller. We have this A to Z of classical music, which is a real basic overview uh, with a 700-page book inserted, and that sells for $12.99. That's a two-disc set with the book. Mm -hmm. So various price points, basically. But I see on Amazon some of the prices <clears throat> vary from that $9.99 <clears throat> price. Amazon prices however they wish. Amazon has a very complex algorithm of pricing. If you figure it out, you'll be the richest person in the world. Um, do not look to Amazon for competitive pricing on it. Well, look for it to get the best price. Um, they want to compete with everyone. So they have an algorithm that combines page views, turnaways, means you look at it and say, eh, I'm gonna go somewhere else, um, with uh, the rate of sale and the rate of page views. So Noxos, we did an experiment, this is four or five years ago, that when Noxos was all $9.99, uh, it had 27 different price points on Amazon um, and very odd things like 1414 and 604 and bizarre, bizarre thing. That is still the case uh, to this day. In the digital world, an album download is $9.99, a track download is 99 cents, pretty much uniformly for an MP3 anyway. Uh, but in the physical world, Amazon 
is always playing around with all of this to try to lure you uh, into, or not, not lure you, but convince you to, to, buy, their, to buy that stock. Um, couple that with the fact that marketplace sellers, so those are all the people that hang off the whale that is Amazon. All of those people that you go there and you look at a recording and say, oh, available for these, from these sellers, who are these sellers? That's all the people around the world. People like you, people like me, who have a garage and a collection and they're willing to part with at least some of it, you're making it available on Amazon and you can buy it from that person. So at that point, Amazon becomes a flea market and your, uh, that, Am that marketplace seller is kind of the flea market vendor and you're buying from that vendor if you want. You have to pay for shipping. Shipping is usually $3.99 in the US, but I, I found my own recordings one week after release date selling for pennies. It just happens. It's terrible. As a, as a distributor, how complicated does it get when you have this crazy quilt of, cop of different copyright laws in different areas of the world? I re I'm not asking about the reissues that became a problem. I'm asking specifically if you, have, if you distribute a particular label that's perfectly legal in Europe but isn't legal here mm -hmm. or uh, some other variation of the same thing, does that make life incredibly complicated in terms of distribution? Uh, I'm afraid it does. Uh, when you're talking, you know, when you're talking about copyright, I can only comment on sound recordings, the copyright of the sound recording. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, not, not the publishing. Um, so the, um, on the sound recordings, yeah, and there are some very uh, notoriously uh, strong and uh, eager estates um, in the U.S. of a handful of artists, um, especially jazz artists and, and, and kind of classic, classic artists that some European labels come to us with some radio broadcasts from Stuttgart in 1963 with, they're always the same, Sinatra, Coltrane, Miles, um, Nina Simone, um, I'm thinking of, a, a, I can't think of a couple of other people, like they'll never come out here. It just will not ever happen. And every time that we get something about this, hey, can you give us our opinion on what you think you could sell on this in your market, um, the answer to that is you need to clear all of this if you think you're going to sell it in the U.S. But just my experience, because I've been down this road a few times, like there's no, there might be new Coltrane to be found out there, um, but it's not going to be available without the blessing of the Coltrane estate and whatever financial arrangement needs to be made there. So I assume you're aware that uh, they actually are finally moving in the Copyright Committee in Congress, and they do have a new, how good it is is a different question, but they do have a new law that might actually get passed. Um, is that going to affect your business in a substantial way for the pre-1972 material? Probably, yes. Um, I don't know to what extent and how, how that will really kind of fall. Um, I think it's going to impact a lot of businesses. I think we just need to kind of wait and see. Um, you know, couple that on the copyright side, and then you have the, the whole issue of what's, you know, passionate for us in the industry, at least in the independent music sector of the industry, uh, is that we have a trade organization called a A2IM, Association of Independent Music, uh, who represents the independent label community, of which we're a member, uh, on Capitol Hill. And the independent label community has often suffered uh, at this sort of hegemony of the major labels. The major labels own a portion of Spotify. We do not. And so, uh, you know, for whatever, you know, conclusion you might like to draw there, and there may be none, um, you know, do we know exactly what our market share is in the independent label community? Um, no, we don't really. Not accurately. There's no strong, measurable way. We probably represent about a third. Um, so E2IM and other organizations are fighting on Capitol Hill um, for hopefully uh, a better rate from the streaming services, not just for the labels, but f for the artists, which is uh, very, very important. And uh, so that, and, and it's ASCAP and BMI that are doing the real heavy lifting um, uh, with those on behalf of their artists because they represent so many artists and publisher members. So I think we'll see a lot there too. But uh, the wheels of uh, government don't move too fast, you may have heard. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> go 
going on for a long time. If there's no other questions, anyone? Appreciate you having me very much. Thank you. And yeah. may you continue for many years to come. I hope so. It's a living. <laughs> kind of. It's a living. That's it. That's the way <laughs> to do it. So how do you, uh, there's a joke, like, how do you make a million dollars in the, in the record business? You start with two million? <laughs> <laughs> there's something to that. There's a very something to that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. I just realized something. A little bell went off in my head. Do you know that this is the 10th anniversary of the New York Arts chapter as of this meeting? We started, I think if I'm correct, March of 2008 at the uh, 92nd Street Y, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I know, I'm, go I'm going to change that. That's, De Dennis did that last month. He keeps, it keeps rolling the same way. Our next meeting is going to be on April 19th, which will be Gary Galo, who's one of our members, is going to talk about retrieving one of the early digital formats known as F1. And those who have archives would be interested to be here because it is a rather perplexing early, in, was it hybrid type of format for early digital uh, recording that is kind of difficult to retrieve now and there are certain tricks that have to be done to the signal to re-manipulate it to get it back in phase that Gary would talk, will talk about. So Sean, once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all for coming and a happy 10th anniversary.